Hello from uh, Jerusalem. This is Powers in Play. And our special guest today, we are honored and delighted to have with us Ambassador Kirsika Leto, the um, emissary of uh, Finland, the representative of uh, the government of Finland in Israel. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. And uh, I will uh, go over parts of your distinguished diplomatic career in a moment. And our topic today uh, has to do with NATO and uh, the uh, future, the prospects uh, for NATO's uh, progress following the uh, Russian invasion of uh, the Ukraine. On this program, we have a diplomatic wing and a defense wing. Of course, this is just a mixed bag, but um, our uh, guest uh, next to Ambassador uh, Leto is uh, former ambassador and former deputy uh, foreign minister, Danny Ayalon. Welcome. Thank you. And uh, on this side, we have uh, two uh, retired colonels. Even though in Israel, retirement uh, doesn't really mean that. It only means that you are drawing retired pay. <laughs> but uh, you are still uh, very much involved and informed. Reuven Ben Shalom, welcome. And uh, uh, Dr. Aran Lerman, um, in addition to your uh, military intelligence career, also a former deputy national uh, security advisor. Welcome all. <laughs> Ambassador, uh, Finland has been a lot in the news uh, recently because of what seems a shift in its traditional policy of uh, staying on the sidelines. Um, we won't go uh, back into the use and abuse of the term Finlandization. Um, but the fact is Finland could have joined the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, but decided not to. Has there been now a rethinking, a reassessment of that uh, in Helsinki? Well, actually, it's very much in the process now, and this was triggered by what, what uh, the Russia's uh, uh, aggression to, to Ukraine, that we very rapidly prepared a new white paper, complementary to our uh, government white paper, on, on reassessing the security environment in our neighborhood and in, in Europe. And this is now in the parliament, in the discussion, and one element is a possible NATO membership. It hasn't been decided yet. But, uh, but I th think we will see in the, um, in the course of this month some decisions, some decisions being made, whether we want to join NATO or not. But we clearly see now that the popular opinion in, in polls has shifted over one night, you know, one night after, the, after Russia's uh, invasion to Ukraine. Now it's over 60% uh, of, of people are in favor of joining NATO. So there's a pressure from the people because they see what the situation could be. And, and also on the political side, we see many, many parties coming out of a more favorable position and, and willingness to join NATO. Uh, I want to emphasize that we, we, were not, uh, we were not military aligned until now, but we were not neutral in any way because we were a very active member of the European Union and wanted to develop the European Union. Union uh, security and defense policy, which we still f find important, but now there is a very serious discussion about uh, possible NATO membership. It hasn't been decided, but we will soon see what is the outcome of the discussion. Earlier in your career, you were in charge of NATO affairs for the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, mm -hmm. and uh, you were also uh, on loan, seconded to the uh, Defense Ministry. Mm -hmm. um, and apparently at that time, these um, alliance affairs were not at the center of attention for the uh, Finnish uh, public. As you said, public opinion shifted dramatically. Mm -hmm. According to one poll, it went from 22% to the uh, 68%, mm -hmm. uh, which you um, uh, referred to. There is some obligation, of course, mm -hmm. in joining such an alliance. You will have to come to the assistance of other mm -hmm. countries, Chapter 5. Um, was that one reason why the Finnish public uh, was not so supportive of the idea earlier? I think we didn't feel the need 
to, to join NATO. We developed very close partnership with NATO since 90s. We've been uh, working with NATO in, in operations, in exercises, in all kinds of... We came, I think, as close uh, to NATO as, as it is possible without joining, basically. Uh, we are very, very uh, interoperable with NATO, and, and we always wanted to, to make sure that, you know, if we want to join, we had this uh, NATO option all along, and one day if we need to do, use it, then we would there would be no obstacles. So... Um, Definitely the time when I was working on NATO issues, it was very much working on the partnerships and, and in, in the NATO operations. And and, uh, and uh, I think this, well, as I said, there was a dramatic shift in, in the security situation in, in Europe. And then we need to be able to reassess the, the um, our policies and also not forgetting the, the European Union role and the European responsibility for their own security. And I think with uh, NATO, possible NATO membership, there comes, of course, uh, responsibilities. And we are, we are very much a security provider in our region. We have uh, maintained very strong military capabilities and strong defense forces, up to 280,000 uh, troops in, in, if needed. And uh, also the, um, there's a strong um, willingness to defend, uh, defend the country militarily if needed, actually one of the highest in the world. And, and then we have uh, also, uh, as I said, very strong capabilities. We just uh, decided to buy 64 F-35 fighter jets from the U.S., which is a, a clear signal from the U.S. as well. This was already decided before uh, the Ukraine war started. So I think we, and we always thought that, you know, if need be, we need to be able to reassess the policy, and now is the time to do it. Kjellerbun, shalom. I wanted to ask you, it seems like... Uh, you have everything that has to do with NATO besides Article 5. Mm, mm. You have the military capability. Of course, you have the same, you know, the same ideas, the same uh, ideology behind it. Powerful military. So many things going on. And you partnership with NATO. You have full interoperability with NATO. So theoretically, you could even fight together. So is it now this, this awakening that, you know what, we have all of this, we should have just been a member, so we have Chapter 5. Yeah. Is, is, that, is that a calculation that you have? I think that's it. We don't have the Article 5 security guarantees. And although we feel very strong, you know, and, and our policy was based on, on very strong defense forces and then partnerships with the close partners like U.S., of course, Sweden is, is one of the main partners and, and other Nordic countries, and then developing the European uh, security and defense policy and, and capabilities, but it's not a military alliance. So, and then also we we of course uh, were developing and uh, having uh, having uh, good relations with Russia, one of one of the elements. And now this element is is of course has changed fundamentally. So I think, and also the way we see that um, the how much risks Russia is 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 willing to take how much they're able to mobilize forces and also discussing about uh, nuclear weapons and all that. So th these are dramatical changes. So I think this made us to rethink that whether uh, the current system is enough and, and we will see the outcome very soon. And, and as I said, along the membership, possible membership comes the responsibilities and we are all very ready for that. Dr. Lehmann, had you still been with the national security staff in Israel, how would you have assessed NATO's future when Finland, uh, as well as Sweden, want to join and other um, European countries in another part of uh, the continent are being uh, deterred or threatened by Russia not to join? Moldova, for instance. Well, um, I think I, we can break this into two very different sets of issues. First of all, the magnitude of Putin's mistake in assuming that the West is what his ideo ideologues have been telling him, rotten, um, sibaritic, uh, determined to live the good life without investing in defense. NATO is fragile. Um, the Trump administration did very little to bolster the alliance, and, uh, and the whole thing will fall apart in the face of a challenge. He couldn't have been more wrong. And, uh, and the transformation of NATO, uh, is by now I think makes actually a strong NATO, uh, I would say this very paradoxically, a strategic Russian interest, because the alternative is a Europe led by a militarized Germany, which is enough to give all of us bad memories in this week. Chills. Um, I'm, I'm wearing the, uh, the, the Dutch tie, I'm Dutch by marriage, 
And that's uh, to commemorate the Befreidungstag, the Liberation Day. And we all remember the famous saying of General Ismik, what is the purpose of NATO? To keep the Russians out, the Americans in, and the Germans in, let's say, in their place. Uh, but and now to bring the Finnish in, and <laughs> as long as we get the Swedes. It, now, a strong transatlantic NATO, in the full sense of the word, is actually a guarantee of possible stability in Europe. And, uh, and that is what I would expect to see on, in, in this respect. At the same time, I also can understand not Putin's action, but the Russian position on the idea that NATO should extend beyond the Dnieper. That, I think, was never really a, a realistic proposition. Beyond meaning east of? East, yes, east of east, uh, Ukraine, Ukraine's regions extend beyond the river Dnieper, deep, deep into uh, Euro-Asia. Uh, and uh, and uh, that was, I think, never going to be a realistic proposition. I think the leadership in Kiev understands it. The European Union, on the other hand, is an important potential uh, partner. And the whole, the tragedy is that there should have been long ago this idea that uh, I think it was Jim Baker who spoke about uh, Vancouver to Vladivostok, a community of nations with common interests uh, in the wake of Soviet collapse. In what direction? And Putin took it, But well... East to west or west to east? Both. And uh, well... As the globe turns. As the globe, it is, uh, a, you know, a globe, after all. And, um, and I think Putin took Russia in a very different direction simply to protect the power structure that, is, that would not fit in this kind uh, of, of Russia today, which would not fit in this kind of world. Hmm. Daniel Elon, please be on alert because I'm going to ask the ambassador a question and then ask you to uh, respond to it from the Israeli perspective. Why NATO? Why not a bilateral defense pact security treaty with the United States would net not be enough because in Israel, of course, uh, not really being uh, able uh, to be eligible for NATO membership being outside Europe, which is good for Eurovision, but not uh, for the uh, alliance. Uh, we couldn't do it. And there were, of course, pros and cons regarding uh, asking the US for um, a defense uh, treaty. But in Finland's case, why not uh, do that? Mm. Well, we already have uh, very strong uh, bilateral relations and military and defense in defense matters with US and with uh, Sweden in particular, also the other Nordic country, countries. But these are not, this is not a military alliance. I mean, this is not what they, they, they are not the same as, as NATO Article 5. And I think now the situation is in such a serious status that we need to really consider we want to if we want to be part of the part of NATO which is actually a, an alliance of democratic nations representing i would say free free and democratic world so and, and led by politicians it's not led by you know military it's yeah. it's um, it's a political military alliance one um, one may argue whether turkey mm, is uh, so democratic Well, um, that's a dis another discussion, perhaps. But uh, anyway, it's a, a family of of, uh, of democracies. I would when Daniel say. Daniel say here's Turkey. <laughs> his his eyes is uh, stand up. Well, yes. I, did, I did drink Turkish coffee, but I call it Greek coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Go Sorry. ahead, ambassador. Sorry for interrupting. So I think uh, this is a, a serious uh, time of thinking, and and what do we need now to make sure? And and, and this is we are not doing these decisions for, against anybody, you know, and we are doing it in order to secure our own own security <laughs> to guarantee our own security yeah. and also that I wouldn't necessarily speak about NATO expanding to sort of borders of, of Russia and so on actually it's the these independent and democratic countries who are want, want to join NATO as members willing to join NATO as, as members of, of the alliance so there should be we should clear in how do we express this And, and we, de of, of course, need also the bilateral relations and all that. But we are now also reassessing, reassessing in this uh, parliamentary discussion that, because it's still open, what the outcome will be, uh, that what are the alternatives? And this also, of course, um, uh, was discussed as part of the part of the subject. And, and then we will make the conclusion what is what is needed 
uh, from our perspective uh, in order to guarantee our security. So I want to emphasize no decision has been yet made. Ambassador Rayalon, um, there are Israelis who are against the defense treaty saying that uh, this will limit Israel's uh, freedom of maneuver in many um, um, military initiatives and in the nuclear domain. Uh, but there are others who are for it, uh, believing that uh, this will deter Iran and others uh, from attacking Israel. But uh, regarding a defense treaty versus NATO membership, what's your view? Okay, first, a very short general comment. You know, after Austerlitz, Napoleon said that he'd rather be fighting a coalition than a member of one. And of course, in Waterloo, he was proved uh, uh, wrong. But there's always this, uh, I guess, debate, you know, whether you want to join a coalition, because there are a lot of, uh, I would say, uh, fringes that are not so much, uh, um, this, you know, advan ad advantageous. In, in, I would say in the case of, of Israel, I think that the disadvantages of being part of a military coalition or part of a military treaty with the United States outweighs the advantages of going alone. I'll tell you why. Because from, you know, usually you, you join, like chapter five, what is chapter five? It's about deterrence, you know? You, mm. We do not need this deterrence because according to some uh, foreign uh, sources, we have our own capabilities in terms of strategic means to defend ourselves. I think also from a conventional point of view, we have proven ourselves to be very effective with the Air Force, with the Navy, and many other in between intelligence, of course, you know, the largest uh, actually branch of our uh, military is intelligence. So it's about uh, alert and, and, and deterrence. And if we are part of either NATO or uh, alliance with the United States, then we feel our heads will be tied. Uh, we will have to consult and we feel like we are frequently attacked more than anyone else. So we need to be agile. We have to be uh, very upfront. In, in the decision making and in the response, sometimes we have to do uh, preemption. You cannot really be a part of an alliance if you really want to do a real, um, you know, uh, preemption. Right. preemption. Right. <clears throat> and the last thing, especially with the United States, is that, you know, we never asked American uh, troops to defend ourselves. Almost never. N almost never, yeah, but certainly not in the fight, not in the, in the in the trenches. I'm not talking about the Patriots in uh, in uh, 91. Uh, wow. But uh, see, from a political point of view, we do not want to have any American boy or girl shed their blood because that may change, I would say, the very, very strong relationship and the strong support that America, the American people have for us. Because we always said, we need your equipment, we need your intelligence, cooperation, political support, but none in terms of military fighting. So I think at the end of the day, Israel will always go it alone unless it is a regional military alliance. And that could be in the wake of Abraham Accords. Maybe this can be seen. Yes, uh, even uh, historically, of course, uh, the uh, Middle East uh, Defense Organization, Middle, or Middle East Command of the early... 1950s was supposed at one time to include Israel, but nothing came out of it. But regarding the military aspect, mm. uh, Ambassador Leto, could you please inform us regarding mm -hmm. the popular base mm -hmm. of military service mm -hmm. um, in Finland, conscription, mm -hmm. um, is it a militia type, um, Swiss model, which is also Israeli, of people serving for a time and then uh, being uh, enrolled in the reserves? Mm. Well, as I said, we have made it with very strong defense forces and, and uh, we have a conscription army. It's mandatory for men, voluntary for women, and increasingly young women also want to to want to be uh, serving in the service. And uh, there is a very strong um, support for that. In the popular, sometimes, you know, before it was asked that if we were NATO members, could we maintain this system? But of course, we, we could, and actually, we, we feel that this is the basis of our defense, you know. If we would join NATO, you know, we would still very much uh, be, be responsible and, and, and uh, for our defense. Including the 2%? 
threshold for of uh, the budget Absolutely. for defense? Absolutely, yes. we will now actually exceed it when with the new acquisitions, with the new fighter jets uh, being uh, being purchased from from the U.S. We are also buying material from Israel. We will buy more now because we also increased our military budget as a as a consequence of the Ukraine war. So. Uh, that will not change. We will maintain that, and, and we actually we, we feel that we are a very much um, a security provider in our region, in the Baltic Sea region, and of course we see very much NATO being also uh, an actor which is promoting security and stability in, in in whole Europe and also within our region. And we we of course are are doing our our share, and we feel that we very much contribute to the security by maintaining the strong forces and and. Uh, and we always did that, you know, we were always ready for all kinds of uh, scenarios. We were not hoping to see Europe in this situation one day, but as you see that well, how we maintain the conscription army and, and very strong defense mm. capabilities. So we were prepared for this. And I think um, already since some years, since uh, some of the actions, because of us, they are in relation to what Russia is doing and, and how Finland is, is sort of reacting, is, is that um, I think the army has become or the, 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 the military service has become something, uh, it used to be a training organization, but I think now it's very much more a preparedness organization. So. Very well. You know, as an outsider for many, I don't think this is something yeah. new. For many years I yeah. see the Finland is a country that has a you know, credible army, military. Mm -hmm. uh, and what's interesting to me when I read about Finland, it's not only, of course, the capabilities, it's also the core values of the country and the resilience of the people. I think we in Israel have a great appreciation for this because, you know, if you have a strong army, but the people are not resilient and don't support, you know, you have nothing. So, like, I perceive a future in which Finland is attacked where that is a country where it will defend itself to the end. OK, um, I, victory, I have a, not to, to the victory, <laughs> to, the, to the good end, to the good outcome. Okay. I, I have to ask, and you know, I want to be careful because it's very typical for a bunch of Israeli men, you know, where we can't solve our own problems, we can give advice to everybody else. So, so I'm not giving advice. But Finland has a woman prime minister. So, <laughs> yes. but so and I want, I want to ask, and I know it's a difficult question, but um, uh, this war now with, with Russia, you know, we can't perceive this in typical Western eyes like Vladimir Putin, this evil guy just went berserk and is doing bad things because he's a bad person. You know, there are interests and calculations, maybe even um, miscommunication uh, perceived by him as if he's being threatened. Uh, and my question here is right now at this point, I can understand why a, a, a citizen of Finland would say too bad we're not in NATO because we would be protected under Article 5. But right now, in this situation, if we move forward as we speak, mm -hmm. as the war is going on in Ukraine, to join NATO, in, in fact, it will double the border that NATO has mm -hmm. with Russia. Mm -hmm. Isn't there a risk that this will be mm -hmm. perceived by Russia mm -hmm. as aggression? Mm -hmm. And the Russians have said very clearly, mm -hmm. you do this. I think they said this to you many years ago. Mm -hmm. You do this, there will be consequences. Mm -hmm. Now we already learned what they mean by consequences. Mm -hmm. So in a way, mm -hmm. and again, I'm not giving advice, mm -hmm. isn't, can't be this calculation, you know, mm -hmm. too bad we're not there. Mm. Maybe not right now, mm. at least for the communication part, because mm. ultimately they will be your neighbors. Mm. You will have to cooperate mm. with them in, in a peaceful Certainly. future. Certainly. So what do you think? So, so please, and, and uh, yes, this is a very delicate mm. moment. Mm. But on the other hand, mm. the Russians would have to split their forces, mm. which are already deep in trouble in the Ukraine if they wanted to open the, um, another front. Mm. Please, Ambassador. Mm. Yes, it's a, it's a good question, of course, but we didn't, uh, we were not expecting this kind of situation. We were prepared for that. And, and uh, I think um, this has really changed the thinking in, in Finland and going through the options that, that should we be part of NATO? Finally, because it's been a discussion, there was not a not a need to, until now. Perhaps we felt that our system was 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 good enough, and one of the elements was having good and decent relations with Russia, and that's our neighbor, and they will remain our neighbors. So I hope that uh, again one day we will have a difficult, a, dif a different time time uh, in in our relations. But it might not happen tomorrow. So. Um, and as I said, we are not this, doing these uh, decisions against anybody. We are, we are doing them in order to secure our, in, guarantee our own security. And if we feel that we need to take some action, I think that when we need to do it from our own starting point, our own uh, policies and, and, and uh, well, 
we will see. Now, now Russia has been, of, of course, critical about uh, Finland or Sweden joining NATO one day, and we know that we have heard it many times. At, uh, at the same time, they have also said that uh, it's up to Finland and Sweden to decide as independent countries what they want to do, what are their, their you know, choices, choices of um, defense and security choices. Then they have also said that there could be consequences, and we have to prepare for those as well. If we want to take this decision, which we do it from our own strategic needs and, and assessment, and then we need to be ready for possible consequences. But what they've been saying now uh, during the, the Ukraine war has been more or less what we have heard before. Of course, the context it is a bit different now, but they are quite busy, as, as you said, in Ukraine at the moment. And uh, I don't know, sometimes I feel that when is the good time to join NATO? If we want to join NATO one day, okay, if they're good days, then you don't feel the need to join join the alliance. Then on, during the difficult days, it uh, somebody might say it's not possible to do it. So I think we do have to do those these decisions as an independent, you know, and, and sovereign country from our study point, not to provoke, not to escalate anything, and, and um, definitely... Uh, one day hoping to have, uh, and, and we will see what, you know, we can, uh, we have an open channel to Russia also, our president has been discussing with Putin and all that, uh, as well as part of the international community efforts, efforts to, to try to have some influence to, to end this, this horrible, brutal war. So, um, yeah. Maybe that's in a nutshell. Aran, I, I know you brought your, your responses from home, no, regardless no. of my questions. No, no, it's, <laughs> I actually wanted to raise a, a new idea that came to me, as, as you were saying. Uh, of course, if when Sweden and if and when Sweden and Finland join NATO, uh, it more or less would turn the Baltic mm. into a NATO lake. Mm. Mm. And the Russians would need some assurance at the level not of mm. Putin as an individual, but mm. the Russians as a people, as for the f uh, for the future of St. Mm. Petersburg and Kaliningrad, mm. Mm. in terms of the existing territory. Mm. I know that Finland was uh, abused and 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 uh, dear parts of historical Finland mm. taken mm. in the in the Winter War, mm. despite mm. the mm. sublime heroism mm. of the Finnish people. Mm. But to uh, uh, in order to secure. Mm the situation, I think the Russians would need some kind of guarantee of the uh, of territorial status quo in the Baltic mm -hmm. uh, as, as part of, of what would make it possible for them to swallow hard and accept mm -hmm. a new reality. Is that on the agenda? Well, I think that you need to ask from, from NATO, for instance, and from, you know, uh, as, we, as we are not part of those, those discussions yet, although we have intensified the in information exchange with NATO, since the Ukraine war started. Um, but, uh, yeah, so it's better to maybe maybe ask, <laughs> ask NATO what the plans so. are there. But I wouldn't say that, you know, Finland or Sweden, we, we are not going to, you know, attack Russia. We are not, we are not threatening anybody. I mean, this is absurd to even think. Yeah, and the I the think Russian even, capability yeah. to feel threatened mm. is yeah. as deep as the step. Yeah. I, I remember seeing a uh, briefing that Israelis received visiting the Russian military academy. Mm. And there were two, the, the first slide was of two ravenous wolves mm. with bloody snouts. One was NATO. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's not to be, that's not mm. unexpected. The other was the EU. Mm. Now the EU as a ravenous wolf, I think squirrel would be a bit more mm. in the- uh, Sheep in wolf's clothing. <laughs> but, but so the Russians, Capability of feeling mm. threatened is, is impressive. Although Iran, interestingly Plus, enough, mm. they did not feel this uh, threat or vulnerability in 1941 when they did not expect or did not uh, mm. prepare for an attack from the Nazis in the well, Barbarossa yeah. operation. Yeah, yeah. So mm. I think this is also something which is uh, adjusted mm. to their ideology at a time. Stalin and, was busy uh, destroying his own army. Exactly. Mm. Mm. Yes. Um, your part of the continent the Nordic countries, mm -hmm. the three Scandinavian countries. And uh, interestingly enough, we have seen uh, former uh, Scandinavian uh, politicians, mm -hmm. such as uh, Carl Bildt from mm -hmm. Sweden, the former mm -hmm. prime minister and then foreign minister, mm -hmm. and uh, Rasmussen from Norway, uh, mm -hmm. former prime minister, and then NATO secretary mm -hmm. general, um, come out with, mm -hmm. with strong support mm -hmm. for Finland and mm -hmm. Sweden joining uh, NATO. but. Is there also uh, a subcontinental grouping mm. for the four countries? 
um, because Nordic, up to now, Nordic countries. your 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 uh, uh, main claim to fame uh, had to do with peacekeeping forces, including on the Golan Heights, right? The mm-hmm. Finnbad, yes. um, and and, and um, we had, of course, uh, Trig Veli, and then uh, Gunnar Jaring, and mm-hmm. and many other mm-hmm. diplomats, and even mm-hmm. a Finnish diplomat who tried to settle the differences mm-hmm. between Israel and Egypt on mm-hmm. the nuclear mm-hmm. issue. Exactly. So is there is there uh, also a shift regarding a regional mm-hmm. subgrouping? Not, not to mention, in by the, the way, that the best voice on Iran is a, is a Finn, Oli Heinonen. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, defense cooperation with um, between Nordic countries, five Nordic countries, has been very strong already. Nordefco in, in different forms, you know, mm-hmm. in, in exercising, in, in, in really um, all kinds of uh, joint operations, and, and uh, so that has been there all along already, and, and as one of the one of the main. Well, like I said, Sweden is is one of the main partners, and the Nordic countries. It's our our reference kind of first reference group. And if you look at the capabilities by the Nordic countries, it's also quite significant as, as such. And then we have been, of course, we see European Union as, as another layer of our security framework. It's not a military alliance, but it's a strong political and, 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 and a broad uh, um, union uh, representing the same values. So we have been working on all these regional groupings, even some others like um, joint expeditionary forces where they have the Nordic countries and also the Dutch and the British. So this has been what we've do, been doing all along, working in different regional groupings as well on, on military and defense defense side. And that's what we're going to continue doing. I mean, it's, it's, it's natural. We need these different different elements and, and to, to pillars to strengthen our 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 security and, and uh, security of our partners. I mean, we also need to, as I said, contribute and and, and, and be part of the... Now, Israel family. is yeah. Israel is an interested observer mm-hmm. um, to what uh, is happening uh, in the Ukraine. Of mm-hmm. course, uh, it has uh, expressed uh, its moral outrage, mm-hmm. but strategically it has tried to remain as uh, neutral as possible because of the Russian presence uh, in Syria, mm. mostly, just uh, to, uh, to simplify uh, the issue. Finland, um, on the other hand, is much more interested, and it is crucial for you, how this all turns out. What is your uh, best intelligence, best assessment regarding how long this is going to go on? Are there reasonable terms on which Putin and Zelensky can agree? I wish I knew. I, I wish I would have an answer to that. Uh, I'm afraid uh, we, it might take some time before there's going to be any settlement. And I think now that we see the increasing also material and, and, and uh, support that Ukraine is getting from the US and, and also from the European countries, Finland has been also sending uh, defense equipment to, to Ukraine several times already. Um, and I think this is something that Ukraine and the and, um, free and democratic world cannot lose. So, and, and um, it's very hard to say how, how long it will take. I, what, what I would you hope consider? it would go, we, there would be a, a solution, but uh, I don't see we, we see any, uh, any, any serious negotiations going on at the moment. I'm not, of course, the one to, following them. I'm not part of them. <laughs> In, in any way, and, and there are certainly attempts, but uh, at the moment it, uh, it, it doesn't look very good in the short term. The victim cannot afford to lose here, mm. but what would you consider a loss? What you consider a defeat? You have to ask the Ukrainians now. I think they they are as you know they need to decide on, on, on they are an independent sovereign country who wants to secure their territorial integrity, which we very much support. And, and we have to remember that this, this war that Russia started, there was no provocation, there's no justification, and it's, uh, it's uh, breaking the, the UN Charter, the, the serious breach of the international law, which is not acceptable. And we saw, see how united the West, Europe, European Union, USA, and other countries have been in condemning Russia. Uh, in the United Nations uh, General Assembly, 141 countries, including Israel, uh, we're condemning Russia's aggression uh, in Ukraine. Uh, Russia uh, 
uh, as, as well with the support of, of, of Israel, is no longer part of the UN uh, Human Rights uh, <coughs> Commission. And so this, we see the response is very strong from the international community, uh, at least from the West. And uh, this is the kind of clear part <laughs> of it. Danny Allen, you started your diplomatic career um, in the United Nations, in the, in the Israeli delegation to the uh, UN. And this was when NATO, following the end of the Cold War, was looking for a raison d'etre. Uh, it seemed as if uh, uh, its time uh, has come and gone and uh, they were going to be um, underemployed, if not unemployed. Is there still a role for diplomacy when brute force is being employed. Can diplomats succeed? Yes, the, the, the short answer is yes. Mm -hmm. And I think it would have been engaged in a more, I would say, comprehensive and effective way before the, bro the, the war broke out. Uh, we all remember in uh, December, where there was a summit in Geneva between Putin and Biden. And I'm not quite sure that Biden completely grasped the imminence of the threat. And there was no uh, any kind of discussions, engagements, only when the Russians started. No, he, he did send CIA Director Burns right. to warn Putin right. before that. Right. But, uh, but there was no kind of a, uh, a, a convergence of alliance. And the consequences to Russia were, I don't think, were you know, put in a, in a very blunt and detailed way. I think this could have made some kind of a difference. But I must tell you, Amir, I listened very carefully to uh, what Ambassador Lechto said, and I fully agree that the West cannot afford to lose in this war. Mm -hmm. But I'm afraid also from Putin's point of view, he cannot afford mm -hmm. to lose in this war. So we are now in the midst of a very, very dangerous mm -hmm. situation, probably the most dangerous uh, since 1945. Uh, uh, I think it's. I think we're even worse than 62. I think we're even worse than 62 because uh, uh, Putin is not uh, Khrushchev, and uh, and there are other some uh, you know geopolitical differences. And here, if there would not be any kind of maybe outside, you know, Gutierrez, the Secretary General, mm -hmm. was in Moscow, but to no avail. But I think if there and were he was in Kiev and Russia and, was and bombing Kiev, Kiev when yes. the United uh, Nations right. Secretary General was in the right. in the So time, anyway, so. if if there will not be some kind of um, I would say uh, reckoning, um, maybe even bring the Chinese in to influence uh, Putin, we are headed to a very very very. You won't be able to get them out. Grim situation, later. of course not. But, because uh, I agree that diplomacy has to be the solution, and I believe in diplomacy. As a diplomat, yes. you know, you always need to believe in that. But there were serious discussions before the, the war. Russia started the war. But there are certain principles that cannot be discussed, like the, also the NATO open door policy, which is fundamental principle of NATO, and also for, of course, us not being part of NATO, uh, at least yet. So these are things that you can't uh, agree on. Perhaps you can't... Uh, Negotiate, but there were other elements that uh, the West was ready to discuss. You know about arms control and sure. uh, transparency and all kinds of issues, and and uh, replied also to Russia's uh, demands on the letters they sent to different countries. But of course, on you cannot uh, adjust some certain you know fundamental principles. Sure. Sure. But I really right. hope that there will be a diplomatic solution, and and, and of course sooner than later. Turkey has been mediating there as well. And, and, and I uh, think now the most important thing is to offer the West mm -hmm. to offer a letter mm -hmm. to put it to climb down the tree. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid mm -hmm. the currency that will be paid by is Ukrainian currency. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you talk real politics, Ukrainian interest vis-a-vis -vis the international, the worst mm -hmm. of the world, mm -hmm. I think that the Ukrainians will have to give. I'm saying it in a, with a very heavy heart because it's not fair and it was an aggression. But I think at the end of the day, in order to keep world uh, stability and peaceful situation, I think the Ukrainians will have to give in. Ambassador, what it's you up, should... Up, what? up to the Ukrainians I to know, decide. Of course, and I of think course. today what you see in Ukraine and, and the spirit and the losses they've had, I mean, in, 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 in human, sure. uh, human beings. Sure. And, and, There's and, no and, way Russia can so. keep Mariupol. Amb Ambassador, you should know that um, Danny Alon's uh, former mm -hmm. political mentor mm -hmm. Um, is the Moldova-born 
of Victor Lieberman, yes, yes. and uh, Danny's outlook is heavily inspired <laughs> by what he learned at the feet of <laughs> Lieberman. I want to make a, a comment. I think we'll, a very short one. Sure. Well, we have a lot of experience here with uh, entities making up narratives. Mm-hmm. So they want to promote something, you invent a false narrative, and then it becomes reality. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's what's happening there. So Putin was able, in a way, to create this narrative as if NATO was against it, mm. as if Finland joining will threaten mm. him. Mm. The whole concept is is misguided, and I think NATO has greater world challenges. We just mentioned China now. That mm. should be the main focus of the rise of China, mm. yet we're in this invented narrative that Putin created. Mm. Mm. I, I think diplomacy has a chance for a simple reason. Uh, despite Lavrov's talk about the, uh, the Zelensky, the Jewish Nazi or whatever nonsense is now sp- coming out of Moscow, which, by the way, makes me worried about the me- state of mind. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're looking at what looks like an impending defeat. And that's really, I agree, that's dangerous. But they've already given up on going to Kiev. This is not going to end in the bunker in Berlin. Mm-hmm. This is not really denazification. They have already modified their aspirations. So somewhere out there, there is a point of negotiation. Unfortunately, wars do not uh, have a rigid uh, time frame and are not pre-recorded like uh, this show. So uh, we can end and have to end our show while the war is going on. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador Leto, for uh, coming to uh our show uh, and blessing us with uh, your comments. Danny Ayalon, Ruven Ben Shalom, Aran Lerman, thank you all. We will be back for another show of uh, Powers in Play in a few weeks' time. Hopefully, by then, we will know whether the war is about to end and perhaps whether Finland is about to join NATO or at least hasten and the pursuit. And Sweden. Thank you very much. We will be back.